Thank you all very much for coming uh, to the Institute uh, today. My name is Carl Stitchin, and I'm the director of IELTS. And it's a, a pleasure to uh, welcome our guest uh, for this latest in the director's uh, seminar series for this year. Our guest is Professor Antonio Borg of the University of Malta. Uh, he has a, a lengthy and distinguished career as a human rights lawyer and as an academic at the University of Malta since 1989, uh, where his expertise is human rights law, Maltese constitutional law, and uh, court scrutiny of governmental actions under administrative law. Uh, Professor Borg is widely published in these fields. He, in 2016, published a commentary on the Constitution of Malta, the first in-depth study of the Maltese Constitution, and the only text on the subject. The second edition was published in 2022. He is also the author of the leading cases in Maltese constitutional law, judicial review of administrative action in Malta, and leading cases in administrative uh, law. Uh, Professor Borg's lecture tonight uh, is entitled Constitutional Supremacy, Different Experiences in the United States, India, and Malta. Uh, he tells me he's going to speak for about 40 minutes. There will then be an opportunity for questions. And there will be a drinks reception all over the time. So, without further ado, uh, I'm very pleased to welcome, I'm sure you'll join me to welcome Professor Tony O'Boy. Thank, Thank you very much, Director. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to share my views on the experience of constitutional supremacy in countries which have written the Supreme Constitution, how it has been practiced in reality, judgments related to supremacy, how it originated, etc. But I, did, I will not resist the temptation towards the end of commenting on the UK position, because I believe that the Supreme Court, particularly after the second Miller case, is developing into something like a constitutional or in a country which does not have a written Supreme Constitution. Because John always, John Stanton always corrects when I said the uh, United Kingdom does not have a written Constitution. Uh, it does not have a written Supreme Constitution, but it is written, scattered all over the place. So let me start with the United States. Um, <laughs> Funny enough, this constitution, which in modern times was the first constitution to be treated as the apex law in the country, does not, does not have a supremacy clause. It has a supremacy clause of the federal constitution vis-a-vis -vis the state constitutions. There is, in this limited way, a supremacy clause. But there is no supremacy clause in the United States constitution which declares the federal constitution supreme vis-a-vis -vis the federal institutions, the Congress, the presidency, etc. And in fact, even today, that supremacy emerges not from a statute or from the constitution, but from a very famous well-known case, which is quoted even today, of Marbury versus Medicine in 1803. So that is practically 16 years after the Constitution had been uh, promulgated. And uh, for this reason, therefore, Marbury versus Medicine is what I would call the flag bearer of those who believe, as I shall explain, that the supremacy of a written Constitution is something enmeshed in the DNA of the Constitution. You don't need to declare it. It's part and parcel of the nature of the Constitution itself. And this is important when I shall explain the Maltese experience. Okay? Because we took a more Byzantine positivist um, uh, attitude towards the supremacy of the Constitution. And I remember some years ago when I was cabinet minister, I visited the United States, and uh, I also visited the chambers of the late Supreme Court Judge Antonin Scalia. And 
when I entered his chambers, there was this huge joy portrait of William Marbury, the plaintiff in Marbury's medicine. And when he saw me staring at this portrait, he told me, I hung, and I quote, I hung it there because I owe my job to that man. <laughs> Which is true. I mean, and the facts of William Barbary versus James Madison are extremely interesting because there's a political element, there's a legal element. Um, there is another element which today, today would seem very strange to us. First of all, I, I tell my students it's very easy to remember this case because all the stakeholders or the active people in this case, their surname starts with an M. So it was Marbury versus Medicine, decided by Chief Justice Marshall. But Marshall was Secretary of, Secretary of State when Marbury was appointed Justice of the People. I shall soon explain some of the facts of this case, because this was an appointment of a Justice of the Peace in Washington, D.C. Towards the end of the presidency of John Adams, who was a president, succeeded by Thomas Jefferson, who was what today we would call the Democratic Party, but at that time it was not called the Democratic Party, emphasizing more the rights of states. After all, this then erupted in the eventually in the American Civil War. It's true, the American Civil War was about slavery, but basically it was about the constitutional principle whether the Federation should interfere with the lifestyle and traditions and practices of the southern states, including slavery. So though it's true, it was on slavery, but it was on this conflict between the center and the periphery. So he was appointed, he signed, the president signed uh, the appointment, he also attached his presidential seal to the appointment, but for some reason or another, the appointment was not delivered in time to William Mark. And in the meantime, there was a change of administration. At the time, the change took place not as today in January, but in March. Yeah, so. so, the new president, the last thing he wanted was to appoint a Federalist judge uh, in the judicial system. So he did not deliver the appointment, which is why then Marbury sued the Secretary of State of Jefferson Madison, so that through a mandamus, let us order, the court would order the Secretary of State to deliver the appointment. So this is the turbulent environment and background to, to this case. Now, by the way, there were other three judges who, were not, who did not receive that appointment, but we always uh, mentioned Marbury and not the other and not the other three. And he sued under, first of all, he went directly to the Supreme Court. He did not go, Marbury did not go before a court of first instance. He went directly to the Supreme Court. We shall soon realize why this is an important uh, factor. Uh, and Congress had passed this act, the Judiciary Act of, the Judiciary act of 1789, allowing him direct access to the Supreme Court. And Chief Justice Marshall split the judgment into two. In the first part, the court came to the conclusion that Marbury had the legal right to the office once the president seal had been attached to the appointment, even though it had not been delivered. So the delivery was a technical point. The real appointment took place when the president attached the, the seat. So this gave him the legal right to the office of justice of the peace. It was not judge. And therefore he had the right to request delivery of his commission. And that the refusal to deliver this commission was a plain violation of such right. And look what Marshall did, paving the way for the second part of the judgment. He said, the government of the United States has been emphatically termed 
a government of laws and not of men. This goes back to Aristotle, who said he would prefer to be governed by laws rather than by men. It will certainly cease to derive this high elevation if the law furnish no remedy for the violation of a vested legal right. So here, the court is in actual fact paving the way for enunciation of the principle of the supremacy of the Constitution. For if the government of the United States is a government of laws and not of men, the more so, or to quote the Latin phrase, nulto magis, it is bound by the provisions of the Constitution, which is necessarily supreme, even because it was enacted through a more laborious process than all the laws. So the first point which was decided was, yes, Margaret has a right to claim delivery of his appointment. But then, and here is the beauty of this uh, judgment, then there was the procedure point, which was decided by the Supreme Court, whether the action of going directly to the Supreme Court rather than going through two stages, first the Court of First Instance, and then the Supreme Court was regular. We call these instances when a Supreme Court is a court of first and last instance because you go directly to the Supreme Court. Now, the Supreme Court ruled that the Judiciary Act of 1789, which allowed direct access in the Marlborough case to the Supreme Court, was unconstitutional because it could not be pigeonholed into one of the cases in the written constitution which allowed direct access to the Supreme Court. So here, for the first time, a law passed by the legislature was being declared to be unconstitutional. Now, today, particularly in those countries which have a constitution, this is accepted as a matter of fact. But when you think about it, this is 1803, 1803 uh, what the court is saying is that we, unelected judges, have the right to strike down a law passed by the representatives. The, by the representatives. I mean, this, at the time, was something revolutionary. Today, it's accepted, but at the time, it was something revolutionary. So revolutionary that the supremacy was not even mentioned in the Constitution itself. And therefore, the although Marvel was the case and the government won, in actual fact, it was what we call a pyrrhic victory because the commission, they were not bound to deliver it to Marvel. But in the meantime, the Supreme Court had, for the first time, enunciated this important principle that Congress is supreme only within the four corners of a more supreme constitution. And Chief Justice Marshall had to give a legal, moral, philosophical explanation why this is so, in spite of the fact that there was no supremacy clause in the Constitution. And he eloquently described this ruling in this way. And there's a certain poetry and music in this, in this excerpt. To what purpose are powers limited? And to what purpose is that limitation committed to writing if these limits may at any time be passed by those intended to be restrained? I think mean, it would be futile to first lay down principles in the Constitution, binding Congress and the President, and then the President of Congress can at will um, act in breach of such principles. The distinction between a government with limited and unlimited powers is abolished if these limits do not confine the persons on whom they are imposed and, here is the music, and if acts prohibited and acts allowed are of equal obligation. It is a proposition too plain to be contested that the Constitution controls any legislative act repugnant to it or that the legislature may alter the Constitution by an ordinary act. 
I mean, if you can change the constitution by a simple majority, then there is no difference between a supreme law and an ordinary law, because the moment you declare something to be a supreme law, you have to lock it. You have to adopt a special procedure to change it. Why to change the Dogs Act? You just need a majority of one in bulk. So will we treat the Constitution on at par with an ordinary law? Of course not, Marshall said. Between these alternatives, there is no middle ground. The Constitution is either a superior, paramount law, unchangeable by ordinary means. In fact, in the United States, to change the Constitution, you need two thirds of the Senate, two thirds of the House of Representatives, and the approval by three fifths of the 50 states of the United States. It's a very difficult process to change the Constitution. Or it is on a level with ordinary legislative effects. And like other acts, is alterable when the legislature shall please to alter it. If the former part of the alternative be true, then a legislative act contra the Constitution is not a law. If the latter part be true, listen to this, then written constitutions are absurd attempts on the part of the people to limit a power in its own nature in limited. Now, it is interesting to know that the Supreme Court first chastised the Jefferson administration by saying that they had unlawfully denied Mr. Marbury his commission. And then decided on the constitutional invalidity of the Judiciary Act of 1789. So Marshall first proved that Marbury's legal stand and position was correct, and then, at a later stage, um, ruled that the act was unconstitutional. So that is the American experience. And Marbury's medicine was even quoted in the famous uh, Nixon case as to whether the tapes of his conversations by the way, all presidents used to tap conversations, but the, the only difference was that the previous presidents used to press a button. And in the case of Mr. Nixon, it was voice triggered. So even if his wife told him, uh, I'm going to have lunch, it was registered in uh, everything, which, which <laughs> ironically was his lunch. So that is the American experience. And the Marbury Federalism was quoted by the Supreme Court, ordering Nixon to give up the tapes and there was that shooting, smoking gun uh, conversation in one of them, which actually uh, sounded the death knell of his presidency. Now let's uh, move to India. Why India? First of all, India was the first colony after the Second World War to be given independence by, by Britain. Churchill, of course, was always against giving independence to India, and when he saw Mountbatten, during the wedding of the late Queen, and his other there was Mount Bethel, the man who gave up India. See? So there was always this, uh, but it was a, a question of, of time, this independence. So this was the first constitution given by the British to a former colony. And there's a famous author who wrote 10 volumes on the Constitution of India, which, by the way, those who like statistics, is the longest constitution in the world. The shortest one is in North, the Norwegian one. Uh, but the longest one is. And this guy called Basu, Durgas Das Basu, um, wrote 10 volumes called A Commentary on the Constitution of India. That's why the, the, the title of their commentaries, each running into about 1,500 pages. So, Anything which could happen has happened in India, and he comments on each article of the Constitution and comparing it with the English Constitution, with the UK Constitution, with the American Constitution. So it's a work of art. And in India, they also do not have a supremacy clause. To be exact, they have a supremacy clause regarding the human rights chapter only. So if a law is in breach of the human rights chapter, 
by the way, this was the first constitution after that of the Republic of Ireland, which uh, introduced the so-called Declaration of Principles, which governments should follow, but which cannot be enforced in a court of law. In the Montes Constitution, we have also the Declaration of Principles, and recently the, the Dean of our faculty gave a lecture as to whether they have any meaning. There's nothing superfluous in the Constitution, even if it's not justice but It can be used to assist us in the interpretation of the justice given part. But let's go back to it. So there is no supremacy clause, except for the human rights chapter. So the question arose, if there is a case relating to a non-human rights provision in the Constitution, is that non-human rights provision in the Constitution supreme? And the well-known Indian jurist, Bazu, states that even though the supremacy clause in the Indian Constitution is limited to conflict of any measure with the human rights provisions of the Constitution, Cain's law has determined that supremacy of the Constitution applied to all the provisions of India's supreme law, not just the human rights chapter. This is probably judicial creativity at its best. And then he goes on to quote a case, Gopalan versus the state of Madras in 1950, where the Supreme Court even said, and there was no need to have a supremacy clause, not even for human rights, because if something goes against the Constitution, whether it's a supremacy clause or not, we should always treat the Constitution as supreme. But, surprisingly, the Indian Supreme Court has gone a step further and taken a very bold step in 1973. And this is the so-called basic structures rule or doctrine. You won't find it written in the Constitution. It is a doctrine which was developed by the judiciary itself. And in a 1973 case against the state of Kerala, incidentally, the only Indian state which more did not carry in the recent elections, and the court stated that Parliament, the federal part, could amend any part of the Constitution, so long as it did not alter or amend the basic structure or essential features of the Constitution. So here you have a Supreme Court, which is developing a doctrine which states that there are certain essential elements in the Indian Constitution which are unalterable. Now, there are some constitutions which expressly state, so for instance, the Italian Constitution, there's a provision in the Italian Constitution which states that the Republican form of government cannot be ordered. So the only way how you can go back to a monarchy is to organize a revolution. I mean, you can't alter the Republican form of government. But this at least is an express provision written down in black and white constitution. Here you have the apex court in India declaring there are certain things in the Constitution where even if you have a two-thirds majority, you cannot amend. And which are these features? Again, they are not expressly written down. In the Constitution, the court mentioned some of them. These are, one, the supremacy of the Constitution. So you can never pass a constitutional amendment which reduces in any way or other the supremacy of the Constitution. The Republican form of government, as you know, first it was a monarchy for, I think, one year, and then it switched to a republic in 1950 and caused the problem of how can India remain in the Commonwealth uh, and at the same time be a republic. So then the solution was India will recognize the Queen, the sovereign of the United Kingdom, as the head of the Commonwealth only but not of the head of state. And being more than 24 followers. The democratic form of government, elections, etc. The secular character of the constitution, which of course in India is something extremely important. I mean, there, even if you are fined, they ask you religion. What is your religion? Is it has anything to do with the fine which 
has been imposed upon it. The separation of powers between the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary, and the federal character of the Constitution. And this is an indicative list, not an exhaustive one. So in the future, they could add something else uh, to it. Now, this extraordinary case of judicial creativity has been criticized and will continue to be criticized by the positivists. However, if one takes what I prefer to call a constructive approach to supremacy, one can state that courts of constitutional jurisdiction are not just ordinary courts. In fact, even their composition is different from that of ordinary courts. For instance, in Italy, there are 15 members. Um, five appointed by the President of the Republic, five by Parliament, and five by the Superior Council of the Judiciary. And uh, here you have 11 members, 11 of the Supreme Court. Um, in the United States, there are nine for life, for life. So there are special courts in the sense, and they interpret and apply not civil law or something static, but the supreme law, which is a living legal instrument, and not one which is static or rigid. And therefore, protecting the basic features of the Constitution, which has to be understood against the political background, there had been um, a problematic and dubious declaration of emergency in India at that time, elections were suspended, there was the forced sterilization as part of the control of population growth. So nothing exists in a vacuum, not even court judgments, not even the judgments which I shall mention later on of the Miller case. It was in a particular political uh, bank. So the Indian Supreme Court faced with such intrusions on human rights in the early 70s and bestowed upon itself, that is the best verb I could find, and the power to block certain changes in the Constitution, which would neutralize or undermine the very nature of a Constitution of a democratic state governed by the law. And this was not done, I repeat, not through any legislative interpretation, in, 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 uh, intervention, but as a result of a bold decision of the apex court of India. And now let me come to my home country, Malta. So this is the Constitution of Malta, which has a supremacy clause. Article 6. If any other law is inconsistent with this Constitution, this Constitution shall prevail, and the other law shall to the extent of the inconsistency be void. This is the original 1964 Constitution. It became independent on the 24th of December. It was passed, uh, the Malta Independence Act, by the House of Commons was passed, and then to an ordering council, this constitution was promulgated and came into effect. Now, in the constitution, there is an amendment. How do you change? How do you change the constitution? And there's a three-tiered form of amendment. There is one particular feature, which is the life duration of parliament, where you need a two-thirds of all the members of parliament. By the way, we have a unicameral legislature, and we already have problems with one. Imagine if we had two. But we all have one. It's a union capital legislature, after all, it's a small country. Um, and uh, so the rule is like duration, you need two thirds and the referendum. Then the most important provisions, the electoral system, etc., is two thirds. If a section does not fall under the first or the second category, then you need only a majority of one of all the members. So it's a, not a simple majority, but an absolute majority. Now, the mint of government at that time wanted to shift Malta from a monarchical the after the war with the governor general still the well, independent, but the queen, the sovereign of the United Kingdom, was the head of state represented by government. And Mintoff wanted to change to a republican form of government. Now, according to the Constitution, which had been approved in a referendum, 
so there was a popular sanctioning of the of the doc, of constitution document. This article of, on the supremacy did not feature the entrenched provisions. There is a list of the entrenched provisions. So it says one, five, six, and six was not mentioned. So did that mean that it could be changed the supremacy by a majority of one? And the government said yes, and threatened the opposition that if it did not agree with the government, it would go ahead and amend Article 6. Ultimately, the opposition agreed to the constitutional amendments, but the government did not want a referendum, because at that time, the referendum was required for practically all the provisions in the Constitution, human rights, and particularly the change from a monarchical to an apocryphal monarchy. So the opposition said, once we have agreed on the amendments, we might as well do away without the referendum, and we shall play ball and use a suspension of the supremacy clause by a majority of one to pass the constitutional amendments and then entrench it again this time clearly with a two thirds majority. Now, today, 50 years, 60 years later, 50 years later, so, everybody recognizes that there was a break in legal continuity. Why? Because the supremacy of the constitution is enmeshed in the DNA of the Constitution itself. Otherwise, we would come to the ridiculous situation that those countries which have a written constitution without the supremacy clause have declared their constitution to supreme. And we that who, and we who have a supremacy clause. We found a way how to bypass the supremacy clause in the constitution itself. Incidentally, the supremacy clause was not in the original constitution, it was discussed at the Malta Independence Conference in Marlborough House in 1963. It was added later. So it could well be that when it was added, they forgot to include it in the entrenched provisions, or as the drafter of the Constitution, um, Dr. Professor Cremont, who later on became Chief Justice, said there was no need to entrench it because it speaks for itself. The written Constitution, quoting Marlborough versus medicine, uh, to what purpose do we write written constitutions and then we do not treat it as a supreme law? It is part and parcel of the constitution. Indeed, when he was Chief Justice, he passed a comment to the effect that had someone challenged those constitutional amendments, he would have decided the case in his favor because, in his opinion, there was a break in legal co uh, continuity which was sanctioned then by popular political acquiescence. There, are, there were only two parties in Parliament, and both of them agreed to do away with the need to go for a referendum. And later on, years later, he wrote that such judgment was indicative, the judgment which he said that there was no need for, for a supremacy clause to be entrenched, of how the issue would have been decided had it been brought before the courts. So, in a case which was not related to supremacy, he orbiter said that there is no need to entrench the supremacy clause. And then later on, in a legal writing, he said, had someone, this is the message, had someone challenged those constitutional amendments, it is indicative of how such judgment would have been decided had it been brought before the courts. Of course, and he's not a very impartial observer to, because he had drafted the Constitution. So I mean, <laughs> he had to say that this was not a mistake of his, but a, a misinterpretation of the supremacy. But this Maltese experience goes to show that sometimes constitutional supremacy is sacrificed at the altar of political convenience succumbing to political acquiescence, irrespective of any scruples about breaking legal continuity. And even the new Section 6, which now can be amended only by two thirds, has its flaws. Because if one were to apply again the 1974 strategy, one could say two thirds of Parliament will decide to do away with the referendum, because they did not see it with a referendum as well, but only with two thirds. And 
Now, the temptation has been too strong. I, I, I should have stopped here because it's India, Malta, and the United States. So technically, I should have stopped here, having reviewed the constitutional supremacy as experienced in these three different countries. Of course, there's a slight difference in the size of the countries, but and I'm tempted to tell you a joke because it's true that we are small, but we happen to be in the center of the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean is the center of the world, so there are some good things that we are in the center of the world. <laughs> and some of our attitudes are, are, are following this trend. And so I should have stopped here. However, I could not resist the strong temptation to delve into the recent pronouncements of the UK Supreme Court, which seems to have assumed the role of a constitutional court. This is the contradiction. In a country which does not have a codified Supreme Constitution. And I shall be analyzing very briefly the so-called Second Miller case. You know, there were two cases proposed by Gina Miller. The first was whether one could activate Article 50 of the what would Royal of the United Kingdom from the European Union without going to Parliament. And the second one <clears throat> sought a review, this is more famous, or not always, depending on which attitude you take with judgment. She sought a review of the Johnson government's decision to use its prerogative power to prorogue Parliament for an unusual period of five weeks. I remember Jacob being small going to Mount Morrill to present the documents to the Queen for the Queen to sign to prorogue Parliament for five weeks. Allegedly, this is what she alleged, to avoid debating Brexit in Parliament towards the end of 2019. Now, in that case, a unanimous, so the 11 members of the court were in agreement, a unanimous decision of the Supreme Court ruled that such decision was unlawful. And the Supreme Court, presided over by Baroness Hale, stated the following on the 24th of September 2019. And this is an important excerpt from quote from the judgment. Although the United Kingdom does not have a single document entitled the Constitution, it nevertheless, it nevertheless possesses a Constitution established over the course of our history by common law, statutes, conventions, with important conventions, I shall explain why, and practice. Since it has not been codified, it has developed pragmatically and remains sufficiently flexible to be capable of further development. Nevertheless, it includes numerous principles of law which are enforceable by the courts in the same way as the legal principles. In giving them effect, the courts have the responsibility of upholding, and this I think is the operative phrase, values and principles of our Constitution and making them effect. It is their particular responsibility to determine, to determine the legal limits of the powers conferred on each branch of the government and to decide whether any exercise of the powers has transgressed those limits. It then added, the legal principles of the Constitution are not confined to statutory rules, but include constitutional principles, principles developed by the common law. Such principles are not confined to the protection of individual rights, but include principles concerning the conduct of public bodies and the relationship between them. Of course, here, the court is referring to the relationship between the executive and public. The fundamental principles of our constitutional law are, relative, are relevant to the present case. The first is the principle of parliament sovereignty, time and, the, and again sovereignty from threats posed to it, posed to it by the use of prerogative powers has been protected. The sovereignty of Parliament would, however, be undermined 
as the fundamental principle of our constitution, if the executive could, through the use of the prerogative, prevent parliament from exercising its legislative authority for as long as it pleased. The same question arises in relation, I, I'm still quoting, the same question arises in relation to a second constitutional principle, that of parliamentary accountability, which lies at the heart of Westminster democracy. A decision to prorogue will be unlawful if the prorogation has the effect of frustrating or preventing without reasonable justification the ability of Parliament to carry out its constitutional functions as a legislature and as the body responsible for the supervision of the executive, which is a feature of the Westminster democracy. In fact, this is what makes it different and distinct from the American system, where the executive and Parliament do not depend on each other. You could have a democratic president, someone from the American party, and a Republican dominated uh, legislature. In such a situation, and this is the operative phrase, the court will intervene if the effect is sufficiently serious to justify such an exceptional cause. And therefore, with this justification, the Supreme Court annulled the prorogation as having no effect. Now, incidentally, um, Parliament has passed a few months later, passed through statute, a law blocking any future judicial review of such productive power. So we cannot have a third Miller case because of this nature. So now it's no longer justiciable. So Parliament intervened in 2022 and introduced in the Dissolution and Calling of Parliament Act an ouster, what we call an ouster clause. This is a clause which ousts court scrutiny of executive action, which states, a court or tribunal may not question the exercise or purported exercise of the powers referred to in section two, which is the powers of prorogation. Any decision or purported decision relating to those powers or the limits or extent of those powers, end of story. Now, I have quoted extensively from the second pillar decision because there are two approaches to the analysis of this judgment. Was this case a constitutional one? And was it one of constitutional review or one based on the more traditional ground of judicial review of administrative action? Based on accepted grounds of review, such as abuse of power, unreasonableness. I must admit that the more I read this judgment, the more I come closer to the conclusion that this was mainly a constitutional review case with a flavor of administrative law issues added to it. Why? Because the way the Supreme Court explains the nature of the British Constitution and un enunciates the two fundamental principles of the British Constitution, again, always mentioning the Constitution, relevant to the case, namely, parliamentary sovereignty and the accountability of the executive to parliament, indicates that here the Supreme Court was reviewing an executive discretion or decision from a constitution. And, and therefore, this means that the Supreme Court has assumed the role of reviewing administrative action, even highly loaded politically, on a constitutional basis. For though there is no Supreme Constitution, there is a Constitution in the United Kingdom, and there are constitutional principles. I think in that quote, principles are mentioned three or four times. The novelty of the judgment is that it is not based on an interpretation of a statute of a constitutional nature, but on conventions, principles, and traditions. Now, since conventions are classically defined as rules of political practice, 
consider to be binding by those to whom they are intended to apply, but which are not enforceable in a court of law, the Miller judgment could have changed such definition. It would seem, I can only say it seem, that there are practices and traditions apart from any statute which are so essential to a Westminster type of democracy that even if unwritten, they will be enforced. Another explanation would be, would be that this was a preeminently administrative law review case where we under common law, the courts of law can strike down as unlawful an exercise of discretion. Once the prerogative was subject to judicial review, and therefore justiciable, the improper use of such power was unlawful. This, what I call minimalist approach, however, in my view, considering the reasoning and the references contained in the judgment, although possible, is not probable, and I am certain in the view that the judgment in the Miller case has opened the door to constitutional review in severe and serious cases of constitutional misconduct. Introducing, and here I come back to what I said in the beginning, introducing the role of the Supreme Court in safeguarding the supreme and fundamental norms of the British Constitution. Please, that is my take, and I will be very glad. Thank you for your attention, first of all, and I will be very glad to answer any question on the four countries, because I don't think it is not in the title, and I'll continue examining this uh, judgment, which, in my view, fits exactly into the title of the supremacy of the Constitution. Thank you.